We're going to go now to Donna Bodine's garden in El Cerrito. Uh, Donna's going to be talking about combining natives and edibles. It's something that I know is of uh, great interest to a lot of people. So in this picture, I see we're looking at a fruit tree and some hummingbird sage as an understory. I have the same situation in my own backyard. And here is Donna's uh, charming urban farm in El Cerrito. Um, and she'll be showing us uh, a two two minute video, a two, uh, two separate videos. So we'll have a little chance for questions between the two videos. Donna's native plant uh, garden in the front of her home has been on the tour for five times. So some of you may have already seen her front garden, but today we're gonna to go look at the back garden. This urban farm combines her interests in native plants with her passion for growing food sustainably and organically. Donna has found that native plants and edibles are the perfect combination. As the natives attract native bees and honeybees, which pollinate the food crops and greatly increase the quality and quantity of the harvest in her garden. Donna is a landscape designer. You will find her contact information on the tour's website under Find a Designer. You can also link to her garden description through the agenda, and you'll find her own website at blandfarms.com. So let's go now to Donna. And hi, Donna, how are you? Hi, Kathy, nice to see you. Nice. Hi to everyone who's watching. So um, maybe Donna, you can tell us what are some of the benefits of combining edibles and native plants? Sure, well, it's something that I love to do. Um, I would say one of the main benefits is that native plants attract native bees uh, more than non-native plants and other pollinators and when you're growing food, it's all about pollination by bees. And I definitely am interested in creating a habitat for our native bees uh, because their habitat is declining, but they're also extremely efficient pollinators. For example, they'll pollinate in the shade, they'll pollinate on overcast days where the honeybees aren't out. So I want to have them. Uh, native plants are also one of my primary integrated pest management strategies. So in addition to pollination, they attract beneficial insects, which control pests that prey on my vegetables. So um, it's great to have them for a number of reasons. And of course, aesthetics, it makes a farm look more beautiful and more diverse. And then finally, uh, I'm really enjoying exploring edible native plants um, that's edible to humans. So I'm fine with sharing with birds and other animals, but these plants tend to be really nutritious and they have a lot of micronutrients and antioxidants. So um, it's just part of a, an approach that I think has multiple benefits. Okay, well, let's go look at the first of Donna's two videos. It's an eight minute long video, then we'll have a break. We can answer some questions, so please type them in. Hi, I'm Donna. Welcome to my backyard farm. It's April, 2021, so happy spring. In my videos, I'm going to show you how I've integrated edible crops, including fruit trees, berries, vegetables, and herbs with a variety of native plants to create a functional, healthy, and extremely productive area that has multiple benefits for people and wildlife. I love growing my own food because I have access to the freshest, most nutritious selection of organic produce that I love to eat. 
I can completely control how my food is grown and I can harvest everything at the optimum time. Also, with a host of pollinators and beneficial insects attracted to various native plants, I can see how the garden is in balance with nature. And this keeps my insect, pest, and disease problems to a minimum. On this farm, it's all about the bees, especially native bees. My husband Jim and I bought our house in 2007, and I spent about a year observing the backyard to better understand the site conditions, such as sun and shade patterns and timing, before I finalized the design and we started installing the garden. I'm a garden designer, gardening coach, and maintenance gardener, and my company is Bee Land Farms. Our backyard is approximately 2,500 square feet and now includes fruit trees, raised beds, and free ranging hens. Native plants that attract bees and other pollinators and beneficial insects are interplanted with the fruit trees and berries located in a mixed border where vegetables and herbs are grown by the chicken coop and really anywhere where I can find some free space. Integrating natives into my urban farm brings more plant diversity which attracts pollinators and beneficial insects. Pollinators are needed to pollinate any edible crops that develop as a fruit, which also includes many vegetables. These same plants attract beneficial insects that prey on crop damaging insects such as aphids. This natural pest control happens when the garden is kept in balance with a diversity of beneficial insects. Native bees prefer native plants to non-native plants for getting their pollen and nectar. The book California Bees and Blooms, published by Heyday Press and the California Native Plant Society, estimates that about 35% of California crops that need insect pollination is provided by native bees. And with the right plants, a small urban garden can attract up to 50 different species of native bees. Here's a question for you. Can you name a common homegrown vegetable that can't effectively be pollinated by honeybees? and must be pollinated by native bees? Please put your answer in the chat. Here's what the farm looked like before it was a farm. I love the space because of its flat elevation and the relatively clean palette, which easily allowed me to envision my urban farm design. But we had to repair and rebuild fences and remove unwanted vegetation, including a bottle brush and several non-native juniper shrubs and ivy coming from the neighbor's yard along the back fence. In the end, we only kept the existing walnut tree, which was probably planted by a squirrel in 2008, we installed the raised beds. The beds are positioned where they can get the most sun exposure in the garden. There's also enough space between them to be able to navigate a wheelbarrow through the rows. The raised beds are constructed out of recycled milk jugs and were purchased from a company that's no longer in business. The beds are also in line with gopher wire because gophers are one of the main challenges to gardening here. The plastic material also absorbs heat, which aids in growing veggies in this microclimate, which has a very cool and foggy summers here in Western Garden Book Zone 17. Each raised bed has its own drip irrigation zone, which provides lots of flexibility for what I can grow. 
The raised beds are surrounded by short metal fencing to keep the chickens out. The fencing has an open spacing so it doesn't visually impact the garden too much. Current bumper crops coming from the raised beds are Jersey Night Asparagus, which is a perennial vegetable that I planted about seven years ago with lots of strawberries on the way. I'm growing Eversweet, which is an ever-bearing strawberry variety, and Rainier, which is a June-bearing variety. My fruit trees are the foundation of the farm. I planted most of my fruit trees in 2009. I planted bare root fruit trees, and here's what the area looked like when the fruit trees were younger. My advice when selecting your fruit trees is to grow the fruit you love to eat the most and don't just select unfamiliar varieties that happen to be available at the nursery. It's important to pay attention to chill and pollination requirements and whether these can be met in your garden. Chill hours are the number of hours with temperatures below 45 degrees and above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Many Bay Area locations, especially the most temperate areas right on the bay, require the gardener to select low chill varieties to get decent fruit production. Low chill generally means 300 or fewer chill hours. In addition to chill, some fruit tree varieties need more heat to ripen and be tasty, which is also not provided by our foggy summer microclimate. I've increased the varieties of fruit I can grow in a small space by keeping my tree small with regular pruning and by grafting. Grafting is fun and definitely appeals to the mad scientist in me. It's like putting together pieces of, of a botanical puzzle. For example, I've grafted eight different pear varieties onto my Comey's pear, and this has definitely enhanced fruit production because Comey's tends to bear very inconsistently. I also grafted a Newton Pippin apple onto my Pink Lady apple. I get cyan wood for grafts from the annual cyan exchange organized by the California Rare Fruit Growers Association. The fruit trees are irrigated about monthly through the summer. Natives growing in the fruit tree area are compatible because of their irrigation needs. Some of the California natives growing here include hummingbird sage, Golden Yarrow, Yarrow, Seaside Daisy, Red Flower Monkey Flower Hybrid, California Poppy, California Buttercup, Foothills Penstemon, and sulfur buckwheat. I'm also growing thornless boysenberries and blackberries along the northwest fence. Bee plant has interplanted itself among the berries. I never planted it there. If you live more inland, bee plant will want to be planted in more shade, but here it likes full sun or part shade. Bee plant attracts lots of bees, of course, and having it here boosts my berry production. Thank you for virtually visiting my urban farm. Thank you very much, Donna. That was fun. So let's have a few questions here before we go to your second video. So one question is, how big is your lot? How much space do you have? Oh, 
I can't hear you. My backyard is about 2,500 square feet. I do have a deck that's about 300 square feet. Mm -hmm. uh, my total lot is 5,000 square feet. So in the back, I'm gardening with about 2,000 square feet. So it's kind of a standard lot, like somebody else could do this, right? I mean, Absolutely. I would say lot. it's a bit on the large size for an urban area, but mm -hmm. many of my neighbors have equivalent space. Yeah, we have 5,000 square feet too. So you asked this question, and it's a cliffhanger, I know. Um, what commonly grown vegetable and fruit rely on pollination by native bees? And alert reader, Laura says tomatoes. Is she correct? Absolutely, that is correct. I think there's two answers maybe. Um, fruit in the nightshade family. So eggplant is another one. I think eggplant is even maybe a little bit harder to pollinate than tomatoes but those are the two. Can you explain what it is about native bees? Why don't honeybees, why can't they do it? Well, I think it's just not part of their morphology and how they get pollen. There's some bees that buzz. We love that sound, but the buzzing actually enables pollen to be taken from the male part to the female part, which is what's needed. And our bumblebees do it, and a lot of our solitary native bees also do that, and honeybees do not. Mm -hmm. So really anybody who's interested in growing edibles should also really be interested in growing uh, natives as companion plants. Yes, I, that's definitely my approach, and I've had a lot of success with it. And I've seen successes with my clients and friends as well. Yeah, I do the same thing in our yard. People might think I only have native plants, but that's not true. I have about a dozen fruit trees in our yard. I've seen them. I've been to your house for some great grafting and pruning workshops, which have helped me, you know, along the way for a long time. Yeah, I think it's a great combination. So uh, someone asked, how did you get rid of the ivy? Well, when we built the back fence, we asked the neighbors if we could remove a lot of the ivy that was encroaching on our property. So we pulled it, we hand removed it. That's really all I do for weeds, you know, sheet mulching, uh, smothering with mulch and lots of hand pulling. That's all that works for ivy. We built the fence. The ivy is now, of course, crept back and it creeps through the fence. Um, I would say it does actually pr prevent me a little bit from exploring that space more vertically and having more berries and grapes there because it's really difficult to grow anything perennial on my side. So I am losing valuable space, but I continue to just pull it. You know, I, I sometimes feel like I wish I had some Roundup, but of course I don't have any. I think that ivy is not something to be afraid of. We had a lot of ivy in our yard when I moved in 30 years ago and a lot of Himalayan blackberry. And it was really just, borrowing our neighbor's green waste bins week after week, cutting it back, pulling it out, and eventually you just, you succeed. So I would not be afraid just because you have ivy. Um, one resource that I'd like to mention that uh, Donna mentioned in her talk was the California Rare Fruit Growers. And we have a very uh, active society. So those of you who are interested in growing fruit trees. They don't only grow rare fruits, but they're just people who are interested in growing fruits. And uh, they have, a, you can join the local chapter for $10. They have a newsletter and meetings and fruit tastings. And that's a fun way to, to make some new friends and get some information. All right, shall we go now, Donna, to your second video? That would be great. All right, Jessica. <clears throat> 
Hi, I'm Donna. It's April 2021, so happy spring and welcome to my urban farm. In this video, I'm going to show you how I attract bees and other pollinators to the farm with native plants. Having a variety of pollinators throughout the growing season is the key to producing high quality and delicious edible crops. I attract native bees to my farm by growing a variety of plants that produce bee attracting flowers throughout the year. Flowers attract bees and other pollinators by offering pollen, nectar, or both. Some of these plants have advertisements such as colorful petals or patterns or attractive fragrances that direct pollinators to the nectar. Some plants are generalists and are visited by many different pollinators, while others have evolved their flower shapes and sizes for a specific pollinator. This is one reason why native plants are more likely to attract native bees. Plant diversity that provides a seasonal sequence of flowering encourages pollinator diversity. Pollen contains protein and is the sole source of protein for bees and is needed for the larva to develop. Nectar provides bees with sugar as nectar contains about 10 to 30 percent sugar. The nectar of some flowers also contains caffeine. Flowers vary in the volume of nectar they produce, and of course bees prefer flowers with higher volumes of nectar. Bees view the world differently than humans. They can see ultraviolet light and can best see the lower end of the visible spectrum during the daytime, which is when bees are active. So, favorite bee colors are pale to dark shades of violet, purple, or blue, or white with violet markings. Bees may also visit yellow, orange, or pale to bright pink flowers, although these flowers are less likely to be bee-specific. Flowers with patterns that help bees locate nectar reduce the effort a bee has to put into getting the nectar. There are also certain flower shapes that bees prefer. The best flower shapes for bees are open platform, pollen bowl, buzz adapted, and bee access. Open platform flowers are easy to land on. This includes most of the Asteraceae or sunflower family. In botany, plant families refer to plants that are grouped together based on some broad common characteristics. Plant family names end in Aceae. There are several plant genera within a plant family. The Asteraceae family has the most plant genera and species in all of California. So it's not hard to find plants in this family to attract pollinators and other beneficial insects to your garden. Examples of Asteraceae family plants include yarrow, Seaside Daisy and Tidy Tips. Some other examples of open platform flowers and other plant families include Ceanothus, which is in the Ramaceae or Buckthorn family, and Buckwheats, which has its own family. Polygonaceae. Also, the lovely annual wildflower cream cups has this open platform shape. Open platform flowers will attract a variety of pollinators and beneficial insects to the garden. Pollen bowl flowers are medium sized, bowl to bell shaped flowers with an abundance of pollen. 
These flowers generally contain little or no nectar. Examples are our state flower, the California poppy, wild rose, and various mallows. Buzz adapted flowers have anthers that depend on buzz pollination to release the pollen. Most buzz adapters also have little or no nectar. Examples include penstemon, and urn or bell-shaped flowers is found on manzanitas. Many of our native bees are buzz pollinators, which are needed to pollinate certain crops in the garden, like tomatoes and eggplants. Bee access plants make it easy for bees to get to the nectar reward while limiting access to non-bee pollinators. Plant characteristics may include bilateral symmetry, such as penstemon, flowers arranged in vertical racemes or spikes, bee-sized floral tubes, anthers and stigmas positioned to precisely brush against a foraging bee. Top bee access plant families are Lamiaceae or mint family. Examples include salvias and self heal. Verbenaceae or verbena family. Scrofularaceae or figwort family. Examples include penstemons, monkey flowers, Chinese houses, and bee plant. And Fabaceae or pea family. Examples include lupins and western redbud. <laughs> Another way I attract bees and birds to my urban farm is to let some of my veggies and herbs flower and set seed. An additional benefit is that some crops will self-sow this way. For example, I've had broccoli self-sowing for years because of this practice. Also, herbs like dill, parsley, and cilantro will self so readily if you let the plants go to seed at the end of the growing season. I'm also enjoying growing native plants for their culinary use, and I'm really enjoying learning more about edible native plants. Some native plants that I'm growing with edible leaves are yerba buena, self heal, coyote mint, and hummingbird sage. Self heal can be eaten as a salad green, and I use the other leaves to make drinks. Also, natives with berries that are tasty uh, to people that is include golden currant service berry and evergreen huckleberry i love my urban farm because i can grow the food i love the most while at the same time creating habitat for bees and other pollinators that really need our help because their numbers are declining due to loss of habitat. My farm attracts lots of bees, which increases both the quantity and quality of the food I grow. Having an urban farm that is in balance with nature has multiple benefits for people and wildlife. Thank you for virtually visiting my urban farm. And to find out more about Bee Land Farms, please visit my website. Okay,
you, Donna. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so let's see, we have a few follow-up questions for your talk. So um, someone asked, maybe see if you know, what is a local native? So I think uh, Sally will ask you to not share your screen for just a moment. Um, Donna, what is a local native replacement for hot lips, a local native sage? Can you think of something that hot lips could be replaced with? Uh, well, I'm not familiar with that variety, but I think our, our white sages, our black sages, uh, salvia leucophila, there's so many hybrids. Uh, the one uh, that I showed in my video is, is Sonoma sage, which is relatively local. It comes from just north of here. It's a lovely ground cover, Salvia somonensis. I also have Salvia bees bliss in the front, uh, which grows to about waist high. Uh, I recently at East Bay Wilds fell in love with a salvia that I believe is called Calamity Jane. Um, that one makes me just swoon. So there, there are quite a few. Um, and I would say starting with Calscape is a, is a great way. Um, but there, there are many local salvias. Yeah, okay. Um, some people said, gosh, there was so much information in your video. So I would suggest that people who want to uh, revisit the material can go to the YouTube channel and watch it again online. You can freeze frame, take your notes. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to say there was a question about the California Rare Fruit Growers. It is a statewide organization. Our local chapter is the Golden Gate chapter. Um, someone asked, uh, Donna, can you tell us what natives do you plant around the base of your fruit trees that can tolerate some water? Uh, well, I, I covered quite a few of those in my videos, um, but I can kind of recap. I've got, um, and again, I'm watering that area about monthly. And generally, that's also how often I water my front native garden. So um, I do agree that the natives need to be paired with things based on irrigation needs. So I have a mixed bed, for example, where I'm growing things like sorrel. I put the prunella in there. I have a hybrid erythranthi that needs a little bit more water, and I also have our native service berry in there. Those I'm watering maybe every two weeks. But everything else around the fruit trees can tolerate about monthly watering. So I've got the golden currant back there, yarrow, golden yarrow, uh, hummingbird sage, uh, let's see, I have a long list. Uh, Penstemons are also there, Seaside Daisy. Uh, so it, they're actually incredibly compatible with fruit trees. And also if you plant young native plants with baby fruit trees, they'll grow up together. So mm -hmm. they almost always have, I would say the same irrigation needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that we will then say thank you very much, Donna. I want to say it was great seeing your urban farm and you. So if you want to reach Donna, you can find her on the Garden Tours website under uh, Find a Designer. You can find her, you can go to her garden by looking at the agenda and clicking over. You can find her on her own website at Beeland Farms. Donna, thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure, Kathy. Have a great day. Thank you.